Good morning. Please come with me to James chapter 3. We will be studying out of James chapter 3 as we begin this morning. We'll be turning our Bibles there as we get started. We are working on house rules and going over those house rules. Um, that is something that the children do not look forward to, the, the sitting down and going over the rules of the house. Uh, parents, probably not real fond of it either, but those things need to happen. We need to know what the rules are, don't we? We need to know how we should behave with each other and with those who are outside of our home, what mom and dad expect of us, and what mom and dad have expected of themselves for so many years. The rules aren't arbitrarily made up. They're established. They are tried and true. They work. And they tell the world who you are. If my children follow the rules that I lay out for them, they will be a de direct reflection of who I am and who their mother is. And so... <clears throat> Are we pleased when they flop on the floor at Walmart? They don't do that anymore. They're much far too big. No, parents are not pleased with that. Even the ones who seem to think, oh, it's just a, it's a phase. This is part of life. You know, let, let them work it out down there on that dirty old floor. Uh, that is not true. What they need to know is that is not appropriate. We are in public. You're not allowed to do that in our house, much less here. You are showing the world how we failed you how we failed as parents, and how we have no rules. That's what you've shown the world, and we should be embarrassed. And yet, we are far too gone to even blush these days. And that's a shame. So <clears throat> house rules are important. That's why we lay them down. You may have noticed in the last three lessons that I have taught out of the book of James, all of our house rules have come out of James. Remember, number one, lay aside all filthiness. That's James 1, verse 21. Show no partiality, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And today we're going to look at watching our tongue, which is found in James chapter 3. In my mind, James, as the inspired writer, is the most practical in his writing to the church. He, he talks about eternal truths, all that we can find, almost all of them we can find in the, in the gospel uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I'm sorry, the Jesus, uh, Matthew 5 through 7. His teachings and the principles there all come out of. You can find all of them in those teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And he makes the practical application. He's already told us that we should pull away, get ourselves away from filthiness and wickedness in our life. And he says to us in that practical application, look into the perfect law of liberty. And then you'll see it, and then you'll be able to properly remove it. And he says, as he follows up, don't be hearers only. Go back to the parents. Did you hear me? Yes. And it's understood you won't break this rule. You've heard what I have said. I've shared with you what is right. And so he says, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. He says to us again in chapter 2, partiality is bad. It, it causes you, here's the practical side, it causes you to hold the rich man in high esteem, and it causes you to look down upon the poor man who is dressed in ragged clothes. He says, brethren, that is not God's will. And now in chapter 3, the tongue. He tells us that man has tamed every beast, every bird, every reptile, and every sea creature, but he cannot tame his own tongue. So again, there's that practical. We, we look at the world and we say, have we tamed every creature on the earth? Every sea creature? I would say that we have. Sea world is a place you can go to see what kind of a grip we have on controlling animals of the sea. Sea world. We get them to do tricks. At a command, at the blowing of a whistle, killer whales come flying out of the water into the air and perform for human beings because we can control them same person who has the whistle can't go home and be kind to his wife or she can't go home and be kind to her husband and James says you see the see where it falls apart there you can do it you just won't and it's a problem of your heart that has to be dealt with that has to be settled if you can tame the tongue you are perfect so again this is important for us because when we come together and participate in the acts of public worship that are scripturally authorized in the New Testament, we must be sure that in our everyday lives we are following God's will in every situation. If we're not faithful as Christians, then we're not ready to be joined in one body and to sing with each other, to sing to each other about the goodness, the graciousness 
in the eternal love of God, not in a way that's pleasing to Him. There's a fundamental issue with someone who misbehaves all through the week and comes back into the house and pretends to be the best kid of all. Knowing full well as you examine the week that you're not. You've done very little to nothing to, to shore up those issues in your life. You've let them run rampant. You misuse your tongue against others. You curse your own brethren. And James says to us, these things ought not to be so. So, watch your tongue. James 3 and verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. James 3 and verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, because you shall receive a stricter judgment. This, I believe this is applied in two ways, uh, the obvious ways. One is that the judgment is stricter from brethren. If you get up and you teach, and you talk about the things that God expects from you, what He wants to see in your life, they're going to watch you. Because if you don't follow through with the very things you teach and instruct based on the Word of God, then they say, He doesn't believe it. Why should I? And God says, so in the sense of just me teaching you in, in this moment, that as you look to me, you're going to say, is He doing that? Does He control His tongue? Because if He doesn't, this sermon is a waste of time. It's, it's hypocrisy. It's wrong. I try to make a point to say to you, I have not reached the place where God expects me to be. Because that's true. But I know what it says, and I know that it applies, and I am obligated by God to teach it. I receive a stricter judgment by the brethren. I receive a stricter judgment by God, because again, He will not stand for hypocrisy. So He says, be careful. If you're going to teach it, you better be doing it. You are not prepared, you are not qualified to share my truth and how that works out in life if you yourself will not be accountable to it. And so a stricter judgment is there for us. And then that practical step, that again, that we like to watch James take. He says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. How big is the bit compared to the horse? What is the bit? A little silver rod that goes into the horse's mouth and the reins are tied to that. Uh, it's how the rider controls the horse. The bit is the thing that when you pull back, that is uncomfortable for that horse, and he will go the way you pull because he's trying to loosen up that strain w w that you're pulling. The direction you pull, he's going to go with you because he doesn't like the way that feels. So he moves the way you determine for him to go. We can do that, and we learned how. Put a bit in their mouth, and now you can control a horse who could crush you at any moment, and yet you have full power over the horse. And he says, what about ships? Think about ships for a moment. You ever seen a ship when they have it out of water and it's up on those rails and they've been working on it and repairing it and you walk along the bottom of a ship and you get to the back and you look at the rudder and it's just this little thing, sometimes no bigger than my hand, that a boat or a ship that is of such massive size is used to steer and, con and control such a monstrous thing. And he says, even against winds and the waves that boisterously push the ship wherever they will. And yet, the guy behind the wheel still has a level of control in that. And just think about the tongue. With the winds that rage in our life, the storms that rage in our life, that I have a rudder, I have control of it, and I can decide what to do with it now. I should use it to guide myself out of this storm, not to make the storm worse. And how many times do we use that small rudder to make the storm worse? Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. It will kindle a great forest fire. Think of uh, Smokey the Bear. Those of you who are old enough to remember Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. 
How do you do that? Again, practical. How do you prevent forest fire? I know Todd knows. Those who are Eagle Scouts know how to prevent forest fires. Well, you don't throw sparks all over the dry ground. You build a, a fortress around your fire, some rocks, some bricks, something, to keep it contained. You keep an eye on it. You don't walk away for hours. You stay with it. You keep an eye on it. You have water nearby in case things go horribly wrong so that you can put it out. See, all those steps that we take, because I'm a camper. I know how to camp. I know how to live in the wilderness. I'm tough, and I know how to control a fire. Oh, good for you. Again, the same person who can control the fire beautifully and teach these Cub Scouts, this is how you control a fire. The same troop leader will go home to his children and destroy their life with his tongue. He's good with fire on the ground. He can't control the fire in his heart. And it's a shame. And James points it out to show us how much of a shame that is. Look down in verse 8 of James 3. He says, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So that should be a big relief to us. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. James says, no, you can't. Nobody can do it. It is full of deadly poison. It is unruly evil, unruly, refusing to obey the house rules. It will not be controlled. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs. Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. We bless our God and Father and we curse our brethren. And, and there's, there's all these layers of temptation for us that the reality is for me, I can say what I want about who I want. I just can't say it to other people. Because if people heard me talk that way, then they would know I wasn't following James 3. So is that true? Can I go home and, and then just let it all go? We talk about how much I don't like anyone here at Northwest, who's really on my nerves, without having settled that with a brother or sister in Christ who's made in a similitude of God. Is it okay then? And you see, see, there's layers there. I could go home and do it where I know no one's listening and I'd be safe, and they wouldn't get their feelings hurt, and I can still vent my feelings. What about cuss words in bad language? How are you doing with that? Say, and I am, I'm doing great. I'm a shining example. I mean, just follow me around and you'll see, not to my house, but follow me around in public and you'll see that I am perfect with these things. How is it some days in our life if something comes off of our lips, even under our breath, we know that wasn't right. I shouldn't have said that. That is not who God is and that's not who God wants me to be. And yet, it is there. It is always there waiting to come out. No man can tame the tongue. And then again, the practical again. Fresh water source. We know that it can only produce fresh water because the source is pure. If you have a fig tree and you know it's a fig tree, it will never bear olives because we know it's a fig tree. It can't bear olives. And that can be worked out in our lives with our tongue. I can say to myself, I am a Christian. Christians don't bear fruit of wickedness. That's not what Christians do. So as I look at myself, if I can see that wickedness is coming out of my life and that is my fruit, then I'm not a Christian. I can say I am all I want, and I am not. I am operating contrary to the will of God. I am damaging the people who are around me. I am not an encouragement to my brethren, and I am lying to myself. I'm a Christian. Stand up for the truth. Unless I'm by myself and someone's made me angry. Then my unruly tongue loses control. You know, the beautiful thing about the tongue, and I've told all of you this before, the beautiful thing about your tongue, remember, no man can tame it. How do we tame the lion, for example, in, in the circus? Well, I don't know. The guy with the whip seems to know what he's doing. He tames the lion. What do they do with the lion when the show's over? Where does he go? To the cage. Why? Because the cage is stronger than the lion. And the cage won't let him out until someone comes and unlocks it. And the lion tamer can go to sleep at night because the lion is in its cage. He can't get out. Taken care of, he's been fed, not going anywhere. God says to us, look at all of the animals of the world that you have learned to tame and put in cages. Then God says, I gave you a tongue 
with its own cage. Close the cage. Isn't that right? That my tongue comes with a cage. And if I just keep my teeth together, then I won't say those things that are hurtful and harmful to others. I won't give the devil ammunition to destroy my brethren. Use that. And as I said, I want to make clear to all of us that this is a work in progress. If you look at verse 13, the very next verse, watch how James points out that, that, that we're working on these things. He says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Again, there's that application for us. I'm wise and understanding among the brethren. Well, how do, how do they know that? By showing my good conduct that my works are done in meekness and in wisdom. This is worked out in my life. By my good conduct, it is confirmed that I am growing, I am doing better, I am following the Lord. I am much better of a person, and I am a much stronger Christian than I was 10 years ago. That is a fact. But I'm not yet what I'm supposed to be. And it's okay for us to be able to say that, because the Bible's clear about that very thing. Philippians 1, in verse 6, Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. A good work has been begun. It has begun in you. It's not complete. It is being completed. It is being worked on. Colossians 1.10 That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's a growing process here. There's a growing pattern. I don't want anyone to look at themselves and say, I can't do it. I'm defeated. It's too much. There, there's too much darkness in me. I keep misbehaving with my tongue. I'm, I keep uh, letting my heart get the better of me. That is something we can see and identify, but it's also something God says, then deal with it. We are to be filled. We're going to look at the 11 o'clock service. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs encouraging the brethren with our tongues. So don't let the tongue that blessed brethren be the very same thing, or the blessed God, our God and Father be the very same thing that curses our brethren. James has talked about blessing God and men with our tongues, and I want us to see what Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 43. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, Jesus is making a point about what they had been taught. He's talking about the rabbinical teaching that derived from Leviticus 19 and verse 18, which says, listen closely to the instruction from Moses, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The Jewish teachers took that to mean love your neighbor, Love your fellow Israelite, love the Jew, and you can still hate your neighbor. Or not, not your neighbor, you can still hate your enemy. Anyone who's not of the nation of Israel, we have a right to hate, and that's what was taught. The enemy, the foreigner. And Jesus says, no, I'm telling you something else. Love your enemy, bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. Watch with me in verse 44. I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. When will I be perfect? When I learn to pray for my enemy, to bless my enemy, not curse them. And this goes back for us to that worldly life, that we don't live in a worldly way, but we live in the world. And so when I leave here from the brethren, I'm still accountable to God as a Christian who loves the Lord. I still can't do this evil thing. When you have an enemy before you, Jesus is clear. Bless them and pray for them. This is the right way for Christians to use their tongue. James told us that we would bless our God and our Father with our tongue, and then we turn around and I curse our fellow man who have been made in the similitude of God. 
we have opposed the will of God. The picture is now the tongue that we declared to be sweet is bringing forth bitter. In our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus told us that it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So now we're talking about the source. Does bitter water flow from a pure source? No. We believe that and we depend on it. If a water source is bitter, will pure water come from that? No. Why? The heart. So I can't fake it. I've got a bitter source, and yet I'm going to come into a situation at my family reunion, reunion, and I'm determined to be nice to everybody, even though I despise all of them. Because my family is so messed up. I have a right. I mean, they're just, really. The whole spectrum is there. But I'm a preacher, and they know that. So, bring all that in. I speak pure things. Is it pure? What's the answer to that? I've said the most beautiful things to my family members who inside, I'm going like this. But with my tongue, I'm saying, man, I miss seeing you. How's life? How are your kids that I hate watching? Well, what's the truth? The source is still bitter. Who knows that? God. Who else? One other person knows that. Maybe two if you're married. One other person knows that, and it is you. You better get it fixed. They are made in the similitude of God. They need the truth. It doesn't matter how many times I've shared it with them and how many times they tell me, I already told you I don't care. I'm going to tell you again because my life is short and so is yours. Judgment day is coming. I am a preacher. I love the Lord. I love my brethren. I love my fellow man. And I want to sit down with you and talk to you about your soul. And now the source is pure. It comes not from me, from Jesus. What did he do? How did he talk to people that were going to say, crucify him, crucify him? How did he talk to them? The people who were stirred up in the mob. Let him be put to death. Give us Barabbas. He had time with all those people without the force of Rome on his shoulders. And what did he say to them? He said this. Don't curse your enemies. Love them with all your heart. Bless them. Pray for them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink of water. The same people who he already knew was going to scream, put him to death. And we get caught up in our little world and we have all kinds of reasons why we can misbehave and do the opposite of what God said this time. Yes, it's a house rule. Yes, I believe in it. Not today. Because my heart is wrong. My heart is bitter. And because that is bitter, that which is born out of the heart will come forth through my tongue. And we will be judged by every idle word that comes from that tongue. I want to show you something too because Jesus deals with it. You know, the wisdom of Christ and all of his teaching it is all here for us. You may think as we go through this, there's still an exception. I mean, I'm not supposed to curse my brethren. I don't do that. I don't do that. And honestly, I don't. But there is a brother who sinned against me. And I mean on purpose. And I've got issue with that. And so I'm not cursing him, but I'm saying what's true. I'm speaking evil of him behind his back. I haven't gone to him. I have not dealt with that because of how bad he hurt me. And now, once again, the heart is justified to speak evil of someone who's made in the similitude of God. And James says, my brethren, these things ought not be so. What should I do if someone in the church sins against me intentionally? But I know that person is here in the room now with their arms crossed, waiting to sin against me again. What should I do? Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 and verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell it. Tell his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Watch Jesus and what he cares about. Yes, you've been sinned against. Go to him alone. He has sinned. He is in sin. He is accountable to God. Go to him by yourself. Save him. Spare him the embarrassment of what he or she has done. Show that you love him by going to him first. Then, in verse 16, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Don't, don't bring everybody. Bring one or two more. That, that gives us two or three witnesses to the event who can bear witness because he's not changing his mind. He doesn't care. 
We're still not trying to embarrass him. We're not reporting it to the church. We've brought in someone else to bear witness. Can I just ask you, if you're going to bring someone in to bear witness against someone who sinned against you, who do you choose? It's up to you. We've gone through the scenario. Someone has sinned against you. Who are you going to choose to bring with you? Think about it. The heart wants to bring your best friend who's going to take your side no matter what. The righteousness, the spirit of Christ that is, in, that is within me says, I want someone who will investigate this thoroughly and come to the conclusion that I need to hear. There could be a chance that I'm wrong. And if I am, I want to know that. See that everyone is still held in the highest possible esteem. This man in sin has refused to repent after you did him the courtesy of, of speaking one-on-one. He says, I don't care, I hate you. And the next step is bring in one more that you love and trust. Someone who's mature. Someone who will look into the Word of God. How many members here will sit down in the middle of a controversy and bring this with them? I'm serious. How many times do you step into a controversy amongst brethren or in your own home and say, we're going here first? I would imagine too often we fail to bring this with us. Because we already know the answer. We know what they're supposed to do. We'll figure it out. I'm smart. That's not wisdom. That's pride. Bring God's word. Share it. And if someone brings a controversy to you, if you're the one who's been asked to come and settle something and, and they say, we want you to help us, we do have an issue, we're trying to follow Matthew 18. You go without Scripture, the Holy Scripture. And they say to you, okay, you've heard the case, what should we do? What do you think? How likely are you to know what passage to quote? You didn't think enough to bring the Bible with you. Will you quote Scripture? Will you give your advice because they think you're good at giving advice? See the problem? This individual has to be someone who is loved and trusted, hopefully by both of these brethren, but by the one who brings him for sure. Verse 17, now this man still, if see Jesus says, probably not going to do it. That's not what Jesus says. He says, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Get the whole church involved. Everyone needs to know this is not getting settled. It is a problem, and these brethren are at odds with one another because of the sin that has been committed. Tell it to the church. What's the hope? This person, by being ashamed, will come back to what's right and what is true and get back in line with the will of God because their soul is at stake. But if they do not, we are to treat them as a heathen and a tax collector because sin has no part with righteousness. They don't stand together. They can't stand together. One has compromised if they try to. And so this one says, I refuse to repent. And so the church says, you need to go. Until you get your life together, until you get this figured out. You cannot be here with us. There can be no leaven in the lump, and you represent sin with your, with your heart, with the wickedness that is bound up in your heart. You cannot be a part of this work. Our prayer for you is that you change your mind. And they need to go and think about that very thing. In Galatians 4, 6, Paul says, Because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. You see that, Christians? Paul says, because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. Not evil, not bitterness. The holy servant of God has been sent into our hearts so that we could cry out to God, Abba, Father. And we should treat one another that way. God is our Father. In Matthew 18, as we looked at that together, I, I want us to see again, I don't want to miss the point here, the, the soul, the lost soul of both parties potentially is Jesus' top priority and concern. 
and, and I know that, certainly by the instruction that he's given and, and what I've said to you as we've read through Matthew 18, but, but if you back up and look at the verses before Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, his instruction is through the parable of the lost sheep. He says, if a man has a hundred sheep and he loses one, that's the one that sinned against his brother. Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to find the one that is lost? If he should find it, he rejoices more over the one than he does the 99 who were not lost. This is the heart of Jesus Christ. This is the heart of the Lord. I've been sinned against by a brother. That means he's in sin. If if it's true, he's in sin. He is the lost sheep in the parable. He is up in the mountain somewhere, apart from his shepherd. And Jesus says, what does the shepherd do? He doesn't go to the injured sheep within the 99 and say, I know, that was tough. Let's sit here and be bitter together. That'll make you feel better. He leaves you with the flock. He leaves you with the 99, and he goes to the one who sinned against you. So again, if I do anything other than what God has told me to do concerning these things, then I'm not working within his will because he's out looking for the lost sheep. And if I'm building my case or if I'm still bitter or can't wait to let them have it with my words, I have failed the Lord in that moment in time because he's out looking. And I've got to be in line with him. The spirit of Jesus Christ has been placed into our hearts. Galatians 4 and verse 6. Our final passage is Colossians 4 and verse 6. I love that they are the same passages in a different epistle. Colossians 4 in verse 6. A beautiful verse concerning our tongues and the way that we use them. Please listen closely. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace. You see the house rules that when we leave here, when we go out in the world. Let your speech always, the things you say, let it always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each and every person in your life. The things I say must be seasoned with salt. It has a flavor to it. Uh, there's grace. And you know, there's, there's a lot of people in this world who try to butter someone up or to say just the right things in the right moment. They've, they've done no premeditated thought in the matter. But they say, oh boy, I've I got to fix this. I need to say something nice. And so they do the best they can. This passage, Colossians 4 and verse 6, is, is extremely intentional. Speak with grace. And so, who knows grace? Who understands grace better than a, than a brother or sister in Christ? Who has had grace extended to them by Almighty God. So no matter what the case, no matter what the situation, I say to myself, yeah, but they did this thing to me. Okay. Did you need the grace of God when you came to Him and begged for His mercy? Can you be saved without His grace? Tell the answer to that so thankful to God for His grace. We're so grateful to Him because while I behaved as an enemy, while I worked contrary to everything that He is, Christ is still on that cross waiting for me to come and look and see what that's all about. So when I speak, imagine the words that I say to you in private, in public, when I'm at home by myself, that they're filled with grace. They've got a, they've got a flavor to them that you can sense, that you can feel. They are genuine. You know from listening to me and talking to me that I don't deserve God's grace. I don't belong here. I'm embarrassed with who I am. The only reason I can be here before you and with you and be called a Christian is because God says, you are worth it to me. And that's grace. It's been extended to me so that I can be here, so that I can stand here and talk to you today. You've received the same grace. And so if I say words to people, or if I think things in my heart, that aren't directly tied to this grace of God, I'm leaving Him. I'm doing something by my own will, by my own desire. Broken and it's hurtful. So embrace the grace of God and then turn with that enormous, enormous amount of grace that's been extended to you. Turn to someone. Let them have some of that. Forgiveness, love, forbearance, long-suffering thinking about others. It takes time. And it takes intention and work. Because these things are not natural for us. 
Please be thinking about this. Let's speak with grace. Let, let's use speech that is seasoned with salt so that when it reaches the ears of those who were intended to hear it, it'll change their life. It'll change who they are and what they think about this world and what it has to offer. Anyone here this morning needs to respond to the gospel invitation that is made available to you as it is in every study that we have. Give an opportunity as you think about your life to make, to make it right with God, to, to have forgiveness given to you by God, confessing Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, repenting of those things that you've done, saying, no more, I want to do what's right, I want to be a Christian. Help you today, come forward while we stand and sing to encourage you.